Hey guys, before we dive into the show, I wanted to tell you about the perfect trailer queue blueprint, which is 100% free and you could download it right now over at the trailermusicschool.com forward slash blueprint. Now this blueprint will help you to completely understand the structure of trailer music, how to build tracks that will be more licensable and have more impact and capture the right people's attention. So whenever you start writing a cue, make sure you've got this blueprint to hand and you can use it to help speed up your process, feel more confident that you've crafted a well-structured trailer cue before you send it off to that publisher or editor or supervisor. Okay, let's get into the episode. One man, one community, in the Trailer Music School's monthly group call. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another group call. This is nice. Uh, nice to see you all, as per usual. Scott! Hey, how you doing? Um, and obviously, for those listeners tuning in to the podcast as well, checking out the uh, the monthly call. So, this one, this monthly call, the, ties in with the brief that we gave last last month, which was a, a subject I, I hold close to my heart, I suppose, which is uh, dramatic piano. Uh, I love writing on the piano, as some of you may or may not know, uh, and I love this type of writing because. Uh, dare I say it, it's so formulaic. It's, it's, it kind of reminds me of building Lego with my kids. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, oh, that color goes there, then we build it this, then we do this, then and then bosh, you've got this amazing Lego structure, or in this case, dramatic piano piece. Um, so we will dive into your tracks. Espen has been uh, listening to the tracks that you guys have submitted, and he says we've got some yeah i don't want to say the word bangers because i don't think you'll get dramatic piano bangers uh but you know maybe uh mm, sweet sweet music maybe that's what we've got here some lovely tracks uh before we do here we got a a huge amount of questions coming into us this month uh so let's let's hit that one question that got fired over to me this month everyone's obviously busy on holiday <laughs> uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh about about customs. Um, so let's dive into this first question. Yeah, uh, it's from Richard. He's asking, how much am I shooting myself in the foot if I'm not in the habit of using buses and groups yet? I okay. tend to write with one instrument per track with its own effects. Is this going to make it hard to make stems later? Okay, that is an excellent question. I just want to put a disclaimer for those people who are listening and can't see. It wasn't actually me that submitted that question to myself. There is another Richard on the call. Uh, <laughs> he's waving. And the, uh, yes, I'm waving too, but you know. Anyway, uh, that is an excellent question. An, an excellent question. It's one of those questions that I don't think people ask enough. Because in my courses, you'll notice that I'm a, I will advocate both camps. Uh, so, for instance, in the trailer music course and the hybrid music course, and usually any writing that involves a lot of instruments, I will make sure that I have all of my instruments loaded up, mostly as a time-saving thing for myself, um, but also for an organizational thing. So when I'm writing an album for big orchestral trailer stuff, I will make sure that I have my stems already selected through groups uh buses and sends that's an interesting one because it's quite difficult to export your stems with the buses uh you know uh, especially in logic it doesn't make it particularly easy you know you know you often have to bounce the stem within logic including the 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 sends and uh, yeah it gets a whole whole mess um so my way around that particular problem is i tend to create a group within logic so i call it a stack in logic you know a bunch of instruments grouped together with their own with their own bus and then i will put the effects on the bus uh and if if needs be i will put the effects well on the individual instruments 
with regard to shooting yourself in the foot, if you're not doing it, it really, really depends. So another situation, for instance, if you're doing, let's say, organic sound design, often I will have no instruments loaded for organic sound design. Uh, I will work on a sound. It's kind of like someone, if I was a sculptor, someone lumping a massive lump of clay in front of me and me just trying to work this piece of clay in the form of a single or a few sounds. Because, you know, for instance, with the throat stuff, it will be a case of me finding a single cello sound or double bass sound or violin sound that I like and then mangling it until I have the sounds. Uh, the only thing that I would say there is to save time with organic sound design or any sound design tracks is to have your stems of drums ready. Uh, because they're the things that are consistent across pretty much all of the trailer cues, your drums. So I would recommend spending a good deal of time having your drum stems prepped and ready. And this might mean that you have huge huge buses of instruments or many more than three or four groups of drums. Uh, you know, the simplest way to do it as I do in the courses, high, mid, low, and sub. The difficult thing there is I often find sometimes I will use a drum for its punch and then other times I will use it for its oomph. So sometimes I have the same drum loaded in different sets but you know that doesn't really matter uh, and then what you can do is once you've written your track and you've gone through your parts you can then just remove the excess players it's entirely up to you richard that what you do my best advice to you is to think what would save me time uh, that's that's the biggest thing uh sometimes i'm more creative when I just load up a piano. Other times I'm more creative when I have the whole orchestra in front of me. You know, it depends on what the picture that you're hearing, the picture that you're hearing, the, what the sound that you're hearing and how fully formed it is. Um, or the other option would be to have a piano for sketching and then have all your stems below. But just ask yourself, will it save me time to have a template? My approach is generally a new template for an album that I will create with the first track. So I might approach a new album with, with no template, find the sounds I want, and then that's my template for the rest of the album. I know Christian Henson does a similar thing when he's scoring a TV show or film. He'll say, this is my template. These are the tracks that I'm using, and I'm only using these for this and I think it's an excellent idea, and I do the same for albums, because then it limits you with the sounds. You don't spend all that time twiddling on Omnisphere or whatever it is. Or the, you know, the worst one, which is going through articulations or presets. Um, if you just choose the sounds for the first track and then bash out the next tracks using only those sounds. That's a superb question. I hope I've kind of given you a rounded answer, um, but that's, that's the way I approach it. Basically, it depends. Uh, <laughs> so there we go. That's that's it for the massive round of questions we have. Uh, whew. Uh, actually, I'm quite I'm quite relieved we didn't have too many questions today. Uh, I'm feeling a little groggy, um, not for any particular reason. Uh, so let's move on to something. Espen has been working on some custom work recently. Uh, right. So do you want to, uh, without divulging any details? tell the listeners and the uh and the members what what it is you've been doing and and why you thought it'd be cool to talk about it today uh well it was more like a, a question for you if you have any experience with it uh because i've done a few customs uh which you get a brief you get notes from the editor and stuff but this time i got an actual trailer to kind of score and I was kind of lost with it because I don't know exactly what points to hit. I don't know if I have to follow sort of the rhythm of the trailer, which it might not really have. Yep. And yeah, it's a, like, how do you create a track that stands on its own? Or does it need to stand on its own? Wow. 
I didn't realize you were going to ask that kind of question, <laughs> uh, which is going to involve a lot of talking. Uh, yeah, with regard to customs. So what Espen's but Espen got a, a custom. He's done customs before. Espen got a custom where he had the visuals. And, and any of you listening or watching who've ever had visuals with a custom will know you suddenly fall into this terrible trap of Mickey Mousing every single movement that you're seeing. You know, you see someone running and you're like, oh, digga, 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 digga. And all of a sudden you realize you're scoring a Tom and Jerry cartoon for an action trailer. Um, so my advice to you with regard to this is to always think about the acts. Uh, editors will cut or move cuts to fit your cue. Not always, but the cuts between acts are the big beasties, are the important ones. You know, the really important ones, if you're going to hit it, and you will see it. Often there's a fade to black at the end of Act 1 because something has shifted in this world. Big cut. So think about it like that, you know, uh, and try not to get in caught up in the, the minutia, the small details. Remember, I'm often talking about, like, painting a picture of the landscape. That's what you're still doing. Having the picture in front of you sometimes offers just more of a distraction. So I don't know. I, I think I probably told this story, but I, I had a custom once that wasn't. I, they sent me the trailer. I thought this is great. I've got the trailer. I haven't had a I haven't had a trailer in a custom for ages. I opened it up. It was black screens with boop <laughs> at the edit points they wanted me to hit <laughs> boop, and that was it. I thought, wow, this is this is really creative stuff. I, <laughs> it's, got, it's really got me going. Funnily enough, it was a dramatic piano trailer. Uh, so. You can you can see how you know that really inspired some Beethoven type of uh, romance going on. Try not to get caught up in the small details. Always remember that you're you're washing mood and atmosphere over the track. Yeah. Yes, there will there will be edit points, but if your track captures them in the first instance, then they'll say, "Oh, we need it to hit this point and this point and this point." So when I used to do advertising campaigns they would often ask for the edit point straight away. You know, when this famous footballer kicks the ball, boom, edit point. When this famous footballer drinks the drink, boom, that's that. And I would have to spend hours shifting my tempo so that I hit at the exact frame. And it was tediously boring. Um, whereas in trailers, you've, you've still got a lot of freedom, which is wonderful. So try to think of the wash. Can I just create a great track that hits around act one, act two, and act three. And right, then yeah. there'll be the act four. Um, so yeah, it's it's difficult. Often what I would do is two things. Uh, uh, it, I don't want to say illegally rip a video from YouTube, but you know, take a video from YouTube, mute the sound, and then compose it to the trailer. So I can practice the art of writing to a trailer. Or I would just watch the trailer once and then not watch it again with having written down or put a marker on my project as to where those key points were. And then you can also, you can kind of fit the tempo through that, you know, okay, well, I, I've got these points generally. Um, yeah. I, I, like I said, I haven't done one of those for a long time, uh, but that was my experience of doing customs with, with visuals. They're, they're rarities, but they're quite fun because, like you said, you end up doing Tom and Jerry score, <laughs> which is, you know, for a horror might work really well. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, there obviously is that aspect. Some some trailers don't necessarily need to have a tempo set through them like a horror horror trailer. There is a, oh, we've got, we've got questions in the chat, Espen. We've got questions in the chat. Uh, <laughs> ah, again, that I see. <laughs> this is, it's the, have I answered your question first, Espen? uh yeah I, yeah that's good so. what a relief <laughs> thanks uh okay so we do this uh question from michael then for dramatic piano how dramatic is too dramatic and is a full grand orchestra appropriate for this genre rather than only smaller strings chamber strings it seems like there are a couple of different approaches within this style yeah, that seems like a very Michael question, Michael. Uh, what, how dramatic is too dramatic? It really depends. Uh, the thing you just always fall back on, Michael, is, is this track exciting me? 
Uh, if it's not exciting, if you know, give it a break over something else. Because the thing is, it really depends on what the track is being used for. The setting is really important. There are a lot of variations. For instance, if we're talking sort of Queen Queen Elizabeth, you know, with big royal battles, the setting is bigger, a full orchestra will be required. When we're talking um, a single character learning to sew a dress, uh, yeah, maybe a full orchestra might be overkill. But then again, you see different trailers for the same film taking different tacks. So if you stick to the basics of this, which is uh, setting the, the right mood, a decent pattern, and a simple and memorable melody, you can't really go wrong. Well, you can uh, create that. You can go terribly wrong, but you know those are the, those are the building blocks that you must stick with. Uh, really good question. Uh, I, think, I think I talked about um, going for sort of Oscar sounds in this, in this one. Was that right? Uh, so, you know, a smaller ensemble, these days is more fashionable almost to the point where it's it's solo strings uh you know which all kind of harks back to the moonlight score everyone still wants to recapture that beautiful uh speedy violin piece that i never remember the name of um so yeah the small ensembles are very fashionable at the moment but you know the worst i can say is can you take some of the strings out or i'll have the stems please (laughs) And then you've solved, they've solved their own problem. Uh, next question. Right. Uh, so follow-up from Frederick about Act 3 specifically. I often find for a dramatic piano that I end up going very orchestral in Act 3 and that it almost stops being a piano track and becomes a strings orchestral track. The piano hardly cuts through unless you really hammer the velocities. I always wonder if it would be better to keep the third act smaller and still keep that piano feel throughout the whole track. But that would either mean doing act two smaller or keep act two the same size, but not get that act three boost. What are your preferred uh, way for this style? Maybe it is mainly act one and two that gets placed for this style anyways, and that is where the focus should be. Yeah. Oh, you guys. Okay. There may have been less questions this time, but they are great questions. Um, oh, Michael's on a follow up. Uh, okay. So let's answer this question, question from Frederick first. Uh, great point. And Frederick, I know you're a massive fan, as am I, of felt pianos, which really struggle to cut through unless you go up to sort of C5, C6, that octave. Um, so the way you can go about that to give that lift is firstly to use pitch, which is jumpy up an octave, and also to not forget to use a sub as the baseline. Say, like, even if it's just a sine tone, something very, very basic, like a sine tone sub playing the underneath that only comes in in Act Three, all of a sudden gives it this, like, Oh, this big weight that just grounds the whole cue. And the lift in Act 3 in this cue, in this style, is often more of an emotional lift. Not necessarily a powerful one, but an emotional one. And that lift could be with a single violin playing a top line. And that's often how I've approached it. I did two... Uh, not solo strings, but very, you know, string trio albums for Elephant Music recently. Uh, So it was kind of like, well, how do I make my Act 3s jump out whilst keeping it's essentially a string trio? Uh, And I used subs to underpin. I doubled up any patterns with uh, sections but I kept them lower in the mix. So it was, you just got the sense of scale rather than this like, immediate orchestra coming out. And I used the top registers of the violin. Uh, those things will give you that, that jump. And I think that if you, if you listen to, uh, I'm terrible with names of pieces of music, but uh, Max Richter does it a lot. 
uh, where he manages to lift the end of his cue without seeming to do anything. You know, even on the nature of daylight. Oh, I remembered it. Um, which is I don't know, what, six minutes long. Right at the end, you, you're like, I'm pretty sure we've heard the same chord sequence for six minutes. Doing very, very little, but I feel very emotional. And it has that lift and on the nature of daylight like, has been used in trailers. Um, and he, I'm pretty sure he has a sub underpinning his strings in there. So there are lots of ways to go about it, but knowing your writing as I do, I would suggest you approach it in that manner. You go, okay, I want to keep it intimate, but I want to give it weight, you know, and it could just be a simple, also just adding a couple of trailer rolls right at the end, you know, uh, they are, they are wonderful, cheap wins for this type of writing where you don't, it doesn't have to be like huge or massive, but if you get a, a lovely sort of subby role at the start, act one, act two, and then as you progress, the role becomes more obviously a bigger uh, drum. Again, it's another, another cheap win to give you that lift. I hope that's answered your question. He's nodding. Win. Okay. Uh, Right, I think we're gonna to have to go to this last question. Oh no, we've got we've got eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yeah, let's go for the for this uh, Michael question. That's a follow up from his last question. How long before should we pick up the pace in these tracks, and by how much? It seems like I've heard a couple of times you're a bit talking about wanting to get things moving by thirty seconds, and I notice a lot of the tracks on as the ice melts pick up really quickly. So there's in the audience listening as the ice melts is an elephant music album. Um, and, and also the, the name of one of my tracks, I think you're referring to the album, Michael. Um, so thank you, Gavin. He says great album. Uh, now I would say, yeah, he, he says egotistically, um, I would say sticking with the first 30 seconds in this type of stuff, because at the end of the day, when you listen to most of these dramatic piano tracks, you're not really hearing much more than a few notes in the first 15 seconds. And you would just extend that a little bit in the next 15 seconds. And if by 45 seconds, I'm still essentially hearing an A minor progression or you know, even just an A minor uh, triad, then I'm going to get bored. So this is where it falls back on you as the listener, Michael, so you have to kind of switch hats, which is to say that, you know, don't write and edit at the same time, put the track down, come back the next day or later on with your listener hat on and listeners and watchers, a very, very simple trick, which I do when I'm in those moments of loss is I turn my monitor off. And when I say monitor, I don't mean speakers. I mean, because I don't have speakers, I just have headphones. I might turn my monitor off so that I can't see the logic file. And it's actually amazing how you suddenly go, oh, you suddenly hear the things that you wanted to hear, but you were so focused on those little blocks in front of you. So general rule, if you haven't got that from now already, is 30 seconds kick into act two, give act two about 45 seconds, which will take you one minute 15, then give us a rousing act three for 45 seconds, and then a very, very sweet and soft sign off at the end. Should bring you to two minutes 20. If you want to go longer, go longer, of course. Um, then you're dealing with intelligent uses of variation because otherwise we'll, we'll suddenly, we'll pick up and go, oh, oh, that's a loop. Uh, you know, which, which let's, let's face it, we all do. Uh, especially me. I, I love to loop. Um, I should get a t-shirt. I love looping. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the best advice for you, Michael, is also to start as small as possible. That's why so many of them start with a bing, bing. Because then you've got room to grow and to lift. Uh, I hope those uh, answers have given you some insights a little bit. Uh, like I said, I absolutely love this style. Uh, I love listening to it. Uh, you know, it's one of those ones that, you know, it, it's great to cook with as well. You know, 
it makes me feel like a Victorian gentleman chopping a carrot. So let's dive into these cues because I know you guys have delivered some great tracks. So uh, Espen, what uh, auditory delights do you have for me today? Uh, I have a lot, actually. Uh, I think we're going to start with Richard. Not you, but okay. the other Richard. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I've submitted myself again. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Dramatic romance. Lovely, lovely stuff. Um, so this had some absolutely wonderful elements. And I'm going to speak to my two favorite parts first. I'm going in reverse order. It was that kind of like digga, 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 the, the fast, the higher um, pattern in the top. I really, really loved that. The moment that came in, I thought, yes, this should have been in earlier in another form. We should have been nodding to that earlier. That would have been a wonderful way to bring act two. I felt dragged a little bit, but when that came in, yes, we had that pace. Even if you had strings underneath in act two going, you know, just doubling it, just, they don't need to be in a phrase, just there giving a little bit of tension. Uh, and I used to uh, loved the bass you had in the first, first act. It was Yes, that's what I was kind of talking about earlier. When you have a really low sound, all of a sudden it just pulls everything down in a good way, it grounds everything. Fantastic. Um, when we got into Act Two, I would it was the track. It, it needed something, so that could be brought in by the pace of that bringing that pattern in earlier. And then once we get to Act Three, we needed a melody. We needed. A, so it, like, it doesn't have to be, a, you know, a, anything ornate or, you know, or long. It can be simple chord tone melody that's soaring above everything else. 
that will lift everything up. Uh, piano choice. I loved the intro piano. If I, I felt like it had a really nice sound to it. Um, the main piano that came with the arpeggio, I would suggest either dropping the velocities a little bit or trying another piano or maybe putting it in a different space. It felt it, it didn't, it jarred a little bit with that first piano, but, uh, uh, is this your first attempt in dramatic piano, Richard? Second. So if you're, that's, you know, that's pretty amazing for your second go at this. So well done. The other thing to consider, you did two drop downs, uh, three drop downs, three drop downs. You did a drop down into act two, a drop down into act three, and then you did a mid act three drop down. Now I know that's quite fashionable to do those mid act three ones as a lift. I'm not sure it worked in the way it should have done. So I would take that drop down out, perhaps even take them all out and just see if you can get that progression going out, going out, up. Um, but either way, uh, just take that last drop down out and let's get a top line in. Just, it, you know, and you can have a, a hero piano playing in single note octaves supported by some violins. That will do the job and that will bring it up. But uh, yeah, great cue. Awesome. Great job, Richard. Uh, let's move on to Thanks. Tim Brown. <laughs> uh, and his track, Jeez. Embers. Tim, is Tim on the... Yeah, Tim's on the call. Hey, Tim. Tim's here. Yes, Tim. Uh, firstly, what a great piano sound you had in that first first two acts. Uh, that was just lovely, and also it was really lovely because it could have gone could have gone full on pop track, could have gone ambient piano, it could have gone post rock because of the soft piano sound. And I'm going to ask you what that was, Tim. Uh, and because of the reverb, and I'm going to ask you what that was, Tim. Uh, Noir. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, what about the reverb? <laughs> I always love hearing this black hole reverb. Oh, who's that by? Is that, um, Oh, I can't remember the name. Espen's no Even looking time. like he knows. Eventide. Okay, cool. Thanks Tim. Uh, 
you did so much right in that you set the mood with the first sound which is so hard to do but it's that thing i'm always talking about which was like if you can give this character straight away you've grabbed me even if the rest of the track is subpar like you've grabbed this wasn't by the way tim just in case uh, you grabbed me instantly i loved it i loved it and then at that point where i go okay what's tim gonna do yes 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 the pattern comes in which i talk about in the piano course which is basically you know you've you've set the tone in the intro and then you bring in a pattern to bring the tension drive the track forward it doesn't have to be anything overstated and this wasn't that was really subtle but the subtlety carried all these wonderful shades of emotion with very very little superb job we got to the next stage where which i felt jarred a little bit when it shifted into either either a different piano sound or the different velocities with the same piano uh, there was it, it lulled a little bit in that section i think that was because what happened was you had this lovely rich sound in the first 45 seconds a minute uh, and that sound went and it was replaced with a much brighter piano so we lost a lot of mid frequencies in the piano so i would suggest keeping that piano going throughout that section and maybe using the brighter piano to pick out the the important parts be it the top note melody basically and the uh the bass notes you know here you're going to go which is again another easy win for those act threes once it picked up and the strings came in the brightness of the velocities made perfect sense uh, uh, we get into a difficult area with this. If we got string players on that track, Tim, and we had it played with a pianist, I, I, I wouldn't change anything. I loved it. It was beautiful writing. But what we get into is we get to this place where, we, and we all have this with sample libraries, where sometimes the sounds don't do the thing we want them to do. And especially with legato strings or or where, where you're shifting between legato and staccato strings, where they're shifting articulations. And there were a couple of articulations in the strings that took me out of the track. And that's what it does. It doesn't, It, you know, I'm lost in this lovely romance. And then I go, oh, oh, that was a weird sample. Uh, so we need to kind of straddle this awkward world where we, we've, where we write for the sample as much as we write for the music. So, and that's why so much music is produced in a similar way, because we're all basically trying to hide the fact that no one has paid us to use an orchestra. So I would ask you to re-look at some of those articulations or hire a friend who plays violin and record a top line, because that's a quality track. Uh, if we can just shift that transition in the piano and get maybe a, even the top line recorded on violin. That's a winner. Yeah, loved that track. Well done, Tim. Great job, Tim. Love that track. Uh, let's move on to Gavin Potter uh, and his track, Winds of Change.
Nice. Another another corker. Gavin, uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, he did a lot of the things that I was kind of talking were kind of like easy wins that really lift your cue. That kind of lovely, subtle trailer role you used transitioning from Act 1 to Act 2 just completely brought us into that pattern. The pattern... Oh. Also, he did that great thing where he introduced the pattern and we all go, wow, this is a great pattern. I love this. This, this is a lovely ostinato. And then you layer it again with another octave or a very slight variation of the same pattern. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's theory, theory of everything. I'm, you know, looking at all these number sequences flying past my mind. I loved it. It was great. Uh, I would probably say the on, my only thing was that you left me hanging. You stopped short before act three where you could have really held held us off for at least another couple of iterations of that last chord and i feel like we could have had more of the back end it was just it was hitting all the right notes for me it felt like it felt intimate and small and full of character in the start and it was full of emotion and drama at the end and all I could hear was this lovely moving piano. There was an orchestra. There were hits, but I was taken with the piano. Uh, so, Gavin, I would like more in those sections, but that was uh, fantastic. Fantastic cue. Uh, really well produced as well. You're welcome. Amazing track, Gavin. Yeah, dude. Uh, let's move on to Mark. And he wanted... Broken Promises. He posted a lot of tracks. So we're going to go with this one. Broken Promises. Wow, Mark, that certainly was uh, dramatic, that one. Um, yeah, great track. Really enjoyed that. Um, 
really nice pattern. I am a huge fan of a single pattern underpinning an entire queue because then you just get to kind of practice growing your through orchestration and through variations on top of that. And it's a really easy way to create tension throughout a track. I feel like you gave us too much too soon though, Mark. Like you're do, 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 starting from the start. We could have held that back and it could have just been like, bing, bing, at least for the first five seconds. And then, da, da, da. Ba, da, ba. So you, you're easing us in to the tension. Once everything came in, once you brought those strings and there was a nice transition, I think it was maybe a minute in. Once we got into that transition, you started bringing the strings, you started bringing the quiet. It was really intense and dramatic. It was, it was essentially a piano and string slow burn, really. Uh, and, you know, with that mind on, it felt very score-like, which isn't a bad thing by any means it was slow and it was mindful and it was thoughtful it, you know had this sort of andante mutt you know walking pace to it uh so i would i would try and ease us into that pattern a little bit more i think that's it i think that's it i really like the way it was i i really like the, I, the also it's unusual to chuck a choir in uh at first i was like oh no choir oh actually this is kind of like, you know, almost like Requiem for a Dream. What's the name of the composer for that? Um, do, 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 do. Clint Some Mansell. Is Clint it? Mansell. Was it Clint Mansell? I think so. Yes. Yeah. It reminded me of his stuff, which is a huge compliment. You know, he does very, very uh, simple but effective pattern-based writing. And, you know, and it's all about the emotion of growth within his tracks. You know, the same with the moon track, moon score as well. Excuse me, I'm just about to sneeze. Or is it going to go? Um, but yeah, great track, Mark. Uh, I, yeah, tr try exploring easing us into the pattern a bit more and then we can go forward from there. Um, Espen, have we got any more? Uh, do we? <laughs> <laughs> We've got, I think we've got time for one more, and then then Espen and I have an exciting announcement. Right, yeah. Uh, okay, let's do Dave, and the Oscar goes to...
Wow, Dave, uh, for once, for a better phrase, that, that stop down at the end came too early. Um, we needed more just before you dropped down. And then, you know, that was a beautiful cue. Beautiful. Especially that lo- once all the strings were in, I was, I was just like, yes, this is advertising gold. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's the wonderful, you know, that's also very Einaudi as well that, that, at that point, because it's got that wonderful balance of drama and class and style, you know, and it's, it makes, it feels like you're watching a small ensemble of strings and someone sat at the grand piano who knows their stuff. Uh, it was just great. Really you know, lovely. Also the string patterns were lovely. Um, couple of adjustments i would watch the portamento which is the sliding lines in the strings like when used effectively and i think sparingly in this type of writing they're great but if you slip them in too much then it's like oh it's like oh you know it's uh, it just again it, it pulls me out of the track the other thing was when you came into act two Dave, Spotify album is awesome too. Dave, you have a Spotify album. <gasps> oh, yes. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go listen to that in a minute. Um, what we should do when we get into act two, I felt like I needed the pattern, another, a little pattern coming in, you know. So, you know, in, in Gavin's track where that pattern came in, at, at just at that point, and it brought, carried us. So you env- envisage the, the pattern as like your guide through act two. The pattern is like, hello, my name's Linda. Would you like to come through Act 2 with me? That brings you through Act 2 nicely and leads you into that last part of Act 3, uh, which, you know, if I'd have written that track, I would be very, very proud. So good work, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great writing. Uh, yeah. Espen. Yeah, great job, Dave. Love that third act. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, uh, announcement. We have a new brief up, which is uh, a horror brief, organic horror. And uh, our friends at Fallout Music Group gifted us with a few instruments. So uh, this month, we're going to give away a couple of instruments to the person we think has the best track for the next uh, brief. And uh, the runners up will also get one instrument, the two runners up. Yes, cool. I'm bribing you guys to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is really exciting. Uh, and also, isn't it wonderful that Espen's just done three fantastic horror tutorials for you? It's, it's great, isn't it? You know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, do go check out, oh, this on the Training Music School uh, YouTube channel, do go check out Espen's horror tutorials because they're fantastic. And he does know his stuff. Um, so... What a, don't don't be so modest. Uh, what what are we looking for when it comes to a horror cue in you know Espen? What are we going to be looking for? Uh, we're going to be looking for the use of space. It's very important that your uh, amazing, creative signature sounds are going to pop. So don't clutter the track with too much stuff going on. And uh, risers is going to be your friend. Big hits. I mean, record anything you find lying around, you know, use your phone. You can make awesome sounds from literally anything. And if you have instruments, that's great too. I can I can tell Richard's excited looking around his castle. What can I record in my castle? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, this one, uh, on, yeah, everything Espen has said, absolutely, uh, we need all those things. Uh, and one thing I always look for in the in these cues, because... Let's face it, there are a ton of horror tracks out there. Um, in the same way, there are a ton of epic hybrids out there. I, I want that thing that I talked about with Gavin's track. I want that thing that grabs me immediately. I want that sound. I'm looking at you, Bridget. You know, I want that, that great sound that I go, how did they do that? You know, these wonderful, messed up, awful sounds. They're your signature sounds. Use those signature sounds sparingly and or intelligently. So what that means is 
don't do what I sometimes fall in the trap of going, I'll just put the signature sound every four bars for two and a half minutes. That's my job done. <laughs> don't do that. Think about how you can grow your track just with the signature sound. And then all of those things Espen mentions will fall into place. Your risers will suddenly make so much more sense. Your big hits will make so much more sense. You know, um, this one's really exciting. Uh, and I, I you, you know, those of you who've been with, with the training music school since the beginning, you'll know how excited I get when we get to get our little recorders out and go, I don't mean uh, the, the wind instrument recorders. I mean, our uh, uh, field recording devices. Um, although I do like a recorder. Uh, I'm very excited to see hear what you guys do with this. Um, I personally, so Esper and I will, will be judging this together. I personally will be, uh, looking for character as a huge part of this. Um, Espen, what will you be looking for beyond, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the money shot for you basically? Uh, a really cool special sound. I think I oh, well, that's character, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking for character too. I thought you were going to say a really good track. Yeah. Thanks, Espen. Uh, <laughs> that's my number one criteria. Yeah, that's good, it. Yeah. Good really track. good writing. Uh, yeah. yeah. We all look for that. Uh, no, um, just, uh, it's going to shine through if you have fun and do something that scares you as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And also, don't be afraid to get weird. Uh, I, for one of the one of the horror tracks I did, uh, okay, it's a couple of years ago now. Does uh, COVID's made time feel like some kind of strange warp? <laughs> Several years ago, I I, uh, I used a tape machine. Actually, I did it about thirty years ago. Let's be honest now. Uh, it, but I I used that sample. I found that sample. I had an old cassette recorder, and I I screamed into one tape, and I recorded it to another tape. So I had two cassette cassette recorders next to each other and i just pressed record and play on the other one of them transferred it record and play so i got natural tape distortion by just transferring it from tape to tape to tape to tape to tape um and then i found that tape just just as i got a brief from elephant music to do some horror tracks and i thought oh oh let's see what this does and it still sounded fantastic so sometimes you can get you know you can get some really wonderful sounds that was my signature sound by the way uh, 14 year old me screaming into a cheap tape machine so i'm not suggesting you go find 14 year olds to scream into tape machines i just think you should look out for interesting sounds uh, you guys know what the deal is and i'm just looking for ways to make cheap jokes really um iphone iphones iphones are absolutely fine uh, also zoom recorders these little chappies here these are excellent uh, in fact i uh, i don't I record all of my piano music on a on a Zoom. <laughs> I can't be bothered to have my microphone set up all the time, so I just plop the Zoom on there. Uh, hashtag lazy. Let's. Man, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> You're so sarcastic, Esper. Uh, that's why it sounds so rubbish, Rich. Right. Okay. Now, guys, thank you so much for turning up. Thanks for those of you in the uh, on the podcast listening. I hope you got something out of it, and I hope you enjoyed those tracks as much as I did. They were some great pieces of music uh, and hats off to you guys for producing such great tracks uh, i can't wait to hear the products of the competition uh, so yeah make sure you guys tune into the, the training music school website uh, to get details of the competition and where you can post your tracks and of course i will see you again next month <laughs>